Well, it's a delight to be with you today. And um, let me just give you a quick reminder of our uh, ministries. So some of you are new. We, uh, we are directing two ministries. Uh, one is called Follow Me. That's where the evangelism, uh, evangelism program, the Nathaniel Project, fits under. And uh, that's what you're doing right now, uh, more of a church evangelism program. And the, uh, the second one is called uh, Joy in Jesus Ministries, and that is a pastoral mentoring type of ministry that we do, um, working with pastors here in the United States, as well as those in uh, South Asia, and more recently in Ghana, West Africa. As you know, or may know, I was laid up for a little while, and uh, that's a picture of me um, in my uh, bathrobe and so forth. Uh, I have a friend that does stuff like that, and that's what, that's what he came up with. So uh, from August until December, we were uh, pretty much laid up, and uh, we're back to about 95%, I think. Uh, just a couple other things that we need to, to work through, and uh, we're working on that. But we do really appreciate your prayers uh, during that time, and uh, also your support. Uh, we appreciate that as well. And I, I'm just glad to be here. Quite frankly, I'm glad to be anywhere right right at the moment. Um, so being here or being somewhere else, it's nice to, really nice to be with you. And um, I, I want to share just, and I didn't ask permission for this, I should have, but just a little bit about um, what we're doing since we haven't been able to go over to South Asia. Uh, we've been involved in building churches, and uh, this is called the Stick Church I don't actually build them. I raise the money for it, or our ministry does. And uh, this is uh, in Nepal, which is a small country between India and China. It's on the, uh, the northeast side of India. And uh, you've heard of Mount Everest. All right, well, that's part, of, that's part of Nepal. So this is the church that the people have been meeting in, the stick church. Can you imagine um, being in this type of church in the winter in the mountains. Uh, now, I think I understand that they may have some sheets of aluminum that they set up, but uh, uh, still, uh, they needed a church building. And so we, uh, we trusted the Lord uh, to help build a church, and uh, it is being built even as we speak, and um, as well as two other churches in India which are being built also at this time. Um, and it's made easier um, of recent because they finally finished a road to this village, which is really good. Otherwise, the, the guy that oversees these churches said, listen, you can go with me. It's a seven or eight hour drive and then a three hour hike. And I said, look at me. Yeah, yeah. You think I can do a three hour hike? I mean, seriously. So they have a road now. And, and, um, and so most of the stuff is going up that road. And we're building on the side of it a living quarters for the pastor and his family because uh, uh, that's a struggle oftentimes. And so we're very grateful that the Lord has provided the money to be able to do that. Now, we have a, another church in Nepal, and this one I'm calling the Mud Church. Um, it was made with, um, yeah, there it is. I think I skipped the one. Okay. It was made with, with stone and mud, all right? And, and now it's, it's falling apart. Uh, and so we need to replace it. And uh, we're trusting that the Lord will give us the money to be able to do that. It costs about $10,000 to build a church. That's not that much. Um, now, we have a beautiful sanctuary here and a beautiful church, and, and theirs is much smaller, you know. So, uh, but they, um, they really need it. And uh, so pray about that. If you ever want to help, uh, there's ways to figure out. In the sermon notes, some of you got them, I believe. Uh, there's some information in there as to how you can contribute. Or did we put any of our flyers in the back? Okay. There are newsletters on the back if you want to see that. That has information in there about this as well. And, uh, and the, the guy that oversees this is always the guy waving, all right? He's a pastor in Kathmandu, which is the capital city of Nepal. And, um, but he oversees these churches as well. And he sent me these baptism pictures. And this is the coolest probably the coldest baptism I ever saw. Look at the waterfall here. Um, isn't that cool? 
you know, to be baptized like that, not only would you get immersed, but then you would hold them under the waterfalls and they would get poured on. Um, okay, you don't need that to happen, but it could happen if you wanted it to happen. So, uh, so there it is. Thanks for letting me do that. Now, I've got a couple caveats. Um, first of all, I apologize for the Sunday I was supposed to be here and I wasn't here, okay? I had what was called the common cold. That's what it used to be called. There's nothing common anymore, all right? So I wasn't able to come, and then it was the wrong tape, and, and I just felt mortified, and, and I won't go into any of that. But that, that's the first thing I wanted to say. I'm very sorry about that. The church I was supposed to pre preach at uh, this Sunday uh, double booked, and uh, believe it, they kicked me out, and he took the other guy. So, so I contacted Pastor Joel. He said, hey, I, you know, I'm available. Um, now, now, the second caveat is the sermon that I'm going to preach um, is right from the book that we wrote, okay? So if you read the chapter, chapter 6, you can sleep if, if you want to, all right? You can just relax uh, because it's right there. Or perhaps during Sunday school, uh, they talked about it and went through it. Um, or I may have preached this sermon here before, you know, and uh, I, I was doing Sunday nights here back when we had it, and um, ask Ginny afterwards, because you keep track of them, I believe. But listen, I, I'm not really worried about whether you heard it or not. Most of you don't remember what you had for breakfast this morning, all right? So how in the world would you remember a sermon from whatever it is? Okay. When you're about to play a game, like a, a major sport, there, there are several things that you need to do. Obviously, a lot of practice. Practice, practice, practice. You got to do that. And then the day of the contest or the night before, there's a pregame meal. Uh, long distance runners often eat a meal with a lot of carbs, like spaghetti. Believe it or not, that's what they eat. And uh, the most decorated Olympian swimmer, Michael Phelps, um, knew how to get ready to compete. All right. Um, I'm not sure what his pre-swim meal was, but what he ate during the training is amazing in that he had to consume, on a daily basis, 12,000 calories, all right? 12,000 calories. Uh, and just to prove that, at least to start with, here's breakfast. Three fried egg sandwiches with cheese, lettuce, tomatoes, fried onions, and mayo. One five-egg omelet a bowl of grits, three slices of French toast with powdered sugar, three chocolate chip pancakes, and two cups of coffee. All right, that's just breakfast, all right? That is my kind of diet, all right? <laughs> and someone, someone said to me, they said, if you swam 45 miles a week, you could actually have that as your diet. <laughs> but uh, for my pregame meal, what I would conclude with is this, um, a, a piece of chocolate cake, okay. All right, so that's the pregame meal. You might want to get into that, and I think you need to. And then to psych yourself out for the competition, you need to put on your game face. All right, this is where you're, you're now focused. You're, you're, going to, you're prepared uh, to go into this game, and you're ready to go, and, um, and it's the game face. You got the game face, all right? Now, but, but you need more than a game face to win. Uh, you've got to have a game plan also. And, um, and the same thing is needed when it comes to witnessing. You, you've got to have a plan. Now, back in 1967, this dates me a little bit. Yes, I go back then, even way before that. But there was a, there was a movie that came out called The Gospel Blimp. Does anyone remember that? Yes. Yeah, okay. Look, all white-haired people. All right, yeah. Uh, the Gospel Blimp. And um, George and Ethel are concerned about reaching their neighbors with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And one night, while enjoying fellowship with some other Christian friends, they see a blimp. And their friend, Herm, who I'm assuming was short for Herman, I don't know that, but I, I get that idea. He gets this idea that they could use a blimp to present the gospel. And with it, they begin firebombing folks with gospel tracts broadcasting Christian music and programs over a loudspeaker. Obviously, that did not work, okay? That was not going to work. But today, from God's Word um, and some good so common sense, I'd like to present some ways that do work, some ways that will make for a good game plan. Everybody is different. Everyone presents the gospel slightly different, has a different style. Hopefully, you'll see during the course of this week from not only Sunday school today, reading the book, 
um, perhaps reading the daily devotional, which you have that in your in your uh, possession as well, or at least you have it online. Um, that that God will reveal to you what your style is. That's the that's the hope. And uh, so Acts chapter 17, turn there please, and I appreciate the fact that Rob's already read this, so I don't need to read it as I'm doing it, but you can follow along in the verses. Verse 16, um, Paul is waiting for someone, or someones. He's actually waiting for Silas and Timothy. Uh, these colleagues remain in Berea, verse 14, for a while. And then for his own safety, Paul was sent towards the sea and stopped in Athens. And uh, the guys who took him down to Athens then go back. They get Silas and Timothy, and so Paul's waiting for them right now, all right, as he writes this. And then verses 17 to 21, um, you should note uh, Paul's modus operandi, his game plan for reaching the community. He has a plan, and he's going to use the plan. Typically, what he would do is he'd go to the synagogue first, and he would appeal to the Jews, if that didn't work, most times it did not, then he would go to the marketplace, and, and on this occasion, uh, some philosophers hear what he's saying. They think he's crazy, but they want to hear it anyway. They want to hear more about it, and so he's invited to the Areopagus to come and speak to them. Paul's strategy, his game plan to witness to these thinkers, would have to be different than what he used with others. Uh, to the Philippian jailer, who was desperate to hear what, Paul, what made Paul different, I think he just laid out the simple gospel and the guy got saved. Um, I, I heard it said that the, the founder of the Bible conference that we ran for a while, Pineberg Bible Conference, Percy Crawford, uh, by one of our speakers, they're both now with the Lord, but, but he said Percy could have read from the phone book and people would have gotten saved. All right, and, and that's the way I think it would have been with Paul um, when, when it came to the Philippian jailer, because he was ready to go. When, when speaking to Jews in the synagogue, however, on the Sabbath, uh, he would open up the Old Testament, and he would prove that Jesus was the Messiah. So he used more of a, an apologetic uh, in order to be able to convince them that Jesus was the one uh, who was the Messiah when come. Now, wh what he said to Lydia who was down by the river, um, probably was slightly different. You know, we don't have a record of what was said there, but, but I'm thinking it was a bit different. But these philosophers, uh, he needed something to grab their attention. Rob read it to us, verse 22, and following, um, as he walked through the city, he saw an altar. There were altars everywhere, all right? In the countries that I go to, particularly one of them, um, has a rule that you cannot proselytize within a certain diameter around a temple. Well, there are temples everywhere, from these little small ones uh, to the real large ones. And I think that's the way it was in Athens as well. There, there were altars everywhere. But he notices this one to the unknown God. Some theories as to what that is. One, uh, it could have been altars to help identify ancient burial sites which were disturbed during building projects of later generations. Uh, this would stave off any uh, untowards uh, ghosts of disturbing the dead, so you put an altar there. Then there's also a theory that these identified locations of sacrifices to stop a 6th century B.C. plague. If that were the case, maybe we should do that here. Uh, okay, maybe not. Let's just pray about them. Then again, maybe they were sincere and they were trying to cover all their bases. Uh, maybe there's a God out there we don't know about, so let's, uh, let's do this particular altar to that God. It matters little to Paul. He has his opening line, his icebreaker, which if you're reading through the devotional thing, you'll see some icebreakers there as well uh, under the, uh, the small group section. And um, he was going to use this among these sour and stoic-looking philosophers and religious thinkers. Verse 22, you great thinkers and religious people. He begins with adulation, often wise to start out in a non-offensive, positive manner. Much better than saying, you pagans and children of the devil who will be splitting hell wide open if you don't listen to me. That doesn't work, all right? I'm pretty positive that's not going to get you anywhere. And so he starts out on a positive way. 
and, um, and, and surely um, what, what he was going to say would work. Now, it is true that sometimes even the Lord, um, you know, used some, um, uh, some rough words uh, when, when he was talking to people. Uh, but he tells us we are to be as wise as serpents and as harmless as doves. Uh, Matthew 10, 16. And so that, that needs to be part of our approach. He continues, I see among your many objects of worship, you have an altar to an unknown God. It is that God which I represent. And then he goes on to introduce them to the God of the Bible, Jesus Christ, without mentioning his name. At least that's not recorded here. Um, but he does talk about his resurrection. And the results of this... Um, Okay, Dan, you just did that. There we go. The unknown God. See, I've, I've lost track here. Sometimes I have Vonnie do this for me, and I think she does a better job. All right, she's there. She's ready to help. All right, the results. Here we go. Uh, some are convinced that he's nuts, and they mock him, especially the Epicurean philosophers who believe the resurrection is physically impossible. It is. But God does the impossible, all right? So, uh, so they were correct to one sense, but not. Others like what they heard. We'll hear you again about this, Kimosabi, they said. Um, verse 32, it doesn't actually say Kimosabi. That also dates me. That's from uh, the Lone Ranger, uh, from the, um, the radio program, the books, and the TV program. Finally, there was a group uh, that did more. Um, they... they they just agreed in principle, but, but they not only agreed in principle, but they joined Paul and they became followers of Jesus Christ. So, so you have some that are like that. Now, there's a guiding principle that we should note, and, and it goes uh, somewhat like this. Um, Dr. Elmer Towns, a quasi-friend who helped me with the Nathaniel Project to some degree, and he was the founder of Liberty University, co-founder, um, wrote a lot of books, all right? And, and he said, methods are many, principles are few, methods may change, but principles never do. That's great. And uh, in other words, for our sake, methods may change, but the message never changes, okay? God's word does not change. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The, the message, the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ does not change. It cannot change, and you better not change it. You give them the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't, don't give them a prosperity gospel or, or the gospel of health and wealth. That won't save them. It's Christ crucified for our sins, risen again in victory. It's not by works lest any man should boast or woman boast. It's faith. Trusting in Christ alone for one's salvation, that gospel is unchangeable. Uh, methods, on the other hand, um, they better change. What worked in the 18th century with Jonathan Edwards, preaching sinners in the hands of an angry God, uh, did not work 100 years later when D.L. Moody was preaching um, his great evangelistic campaigns. The way Billy Sunday preached in the 1920s, standing on top of a piano at uh, times, would not work for Billy Graham. And what Billy Graham did in the last half of the 20th century with mass crusades might not work today either. Uh, that is why the internet must be explored to see how best we can present the gospel. But nothing beats one-to-one, -one, friend to friend, Philip to Nathaniel. Uh, in sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. Uh, let me give you an example, how another, uh, several other examples, how, how methods change. And um, what we say to children varies from how we speak to teens. And it's different to, to one's approach to adults. Uh, it it kind of goes all the way there. The same, same goes with speaking to common laborers as compared to a college professor. When I was in high school, I worked at uh, a camp over in New Jersey, Camp Halawasa. Does anybody know that, what that is? Anybody I got some? I got some? All right, great. All right, well, I, w I was there, and, and on a, uh, one of the nights when there wasn't kids there, um, we would go down to the shore, and, and we, would, we would witness, all right, on the beach, beach ministry. I kind of liked that ministry back then. Um, and uh, we would hand out tracts, we would talk to people, and, and the whole scene, Ocean City, uh, you got the pork roll, the Philly cheese steaks, the fries, the saltwater taffy, I'm trying to get you hungry now because lunch is coming up soon, and you got all of that stuff. And um, so the very first person I encountered on this particular night was a college student, 
majoring in philosophy, all right? Here I was, a hotshot 13-year-old who thought he had the world by the tail, speaking to someone who was at least eight years older, um, who was delving into the likes of John Locke, Epicurus, Plato, and Immanuel Kant. I was still into Mickey Mouse, Rocky and Bullwinkle, uh, as well as the other Saturday morning cartoons uh, that I could watch while eating a bowl of alphabets on the floor uh, in the living room, all right? And, uh, and so here I was against this guy. Um, I couldn't carry his intellectual water bucket. It was no contest. Uh, he blew me out of the water. I moved on quickly to someone else. Fact of the matter is, if I met the same guy today, I might have trouble talking to him. Um, but Paul's method varied a little from the way Jesus communicated. When Jesus met with a Pharisee named Nicodemus, he answered his questions and did so on a level that Nicodemus would understand, challenged his thinkings. Conversely, Christ's encounter with the woman at the well featured a discussion of what? Water, living water. When, when he walked along the shore of Galilee, he engaged the fishermen by talking about fishing, right? Moreover, since it was an uh, Hungarian society, it was sheep and it was crops, Jesus used what was at hand to begin his teachings. Paul did the same thing uh, and to launch into the gospel here. Now, Bill Hybels and Mark Middleberg, in their book, Becoming a Contagious Christian, discuss various techniques, and in chapter 6, you'll see that. And, um, and I've changed the titles a little bit, but I followed a little bit what they said. But before I do that, let me share some techniques that will not work, all right? This comes from uh, this guy here. Uh, sneaking up and scaring people does not work, all right? Uh, being too emotional probably doesn't work either. Um, or don't be emotionless, um, don't invade someone's personal space, uh, don't be a bad listener, um, don't be too excited, and, and uh, don't be too frustrated, all right, when things go bad. That's the don'ts, but let's talk about the do's and, and the techniques for witnessing that we put together here. Number one, seize the moment. And uh, Heibel's called the approach Jesus and Paul used before the Areopagus, the intellectual approach. Um, this is the ability to take something around you, something that someone says, and turn it into a witnessing opportunity. And, and I'm not talking about sitting beside someone on a plane and saying with a stern voice, if this plane goes down, I'm going up, how about you? All right, I'm not suggesting you do that. That may fit under another one of these, but not under this one. Paul uses the altars and the, God, the, the gods on Mars Hill. Christ illustrated with whatever around him. I mentioned that. Uh, personally, what I like to use is the I'm better than I deserve thing. And I've, I've shared this with you before, all right? And it, it's very simple. They ask, how are you doing? And, and you reply, I'm better than I deserve. And eight times out of ten, they will say, what does that mean? Or... Uh, no, you deserve the best, or, you know, you, you know, and then I reply and I say, well, if you only knew, and, and then they, you know, I had one person say, what, you kill somebody, and I said, very close, um, several times, uh, divorce is not allowed in her family, but killing your spouse, uh, no, I never, that never entered my mind, but the, um, and then I tell them, you know, that, that it, without the, the saving grace of God, I'd be splitting hell wide open. So, and, and I go through the whole litany, and it's in my book, so you can read it, uh, of how that I am better than I deserve. Or you can go to my website, um, another one, Joy in Jesus Ministries. No, it's on 800followme.com website, and it's number 125, and you can see a seven minute video in which I tell people how they can be better than they deserve. I have a card that I give to them that has that on there as well. So um, we, th that's how we do it. Um, and, and that's one way of, of witnessing. And if I've done that once, I've done that hundreds of times. I mean, it, it just happens all the time. And it's just a great way to be able to do it. And so I'm calling this approach the seize the moment. And the way this works is you seek the Lord in the morning, making yourself available to him. God, I'm your servant. Uh, is, is there anyone to whom I should share the gospel? If so, give me the words to say and the prompting to say it. Uh, in other words, not only nudge me, but, but push me into that conversation. Then during your day, just kind of look for it. 
and, uh, and then seize the moment. Secondly is the straightforward approach. And my fan, friend and professor and missionary, Ron Blue, uh, likes to use this technique on an airplane with his uh, aisle mates. He calls this cold calling, but he likes to warm them up a bit, and thus he uses the following. And if you know Ron Blue at all, um, you know how he would say that. And he uses the word form, F-O-R-M. F, he talks about their family. O, he talks about their occupation. R, he talks about religion. And then M, and this is what Ron Blue does when he does this, I give him the message. I give him the message. F-O-R-M, family, occupation, religion, message. Peter is an example of this pro approach. Uh, a bull in a china shop uh, is what Peter was like, very direct, and that may be why Christ chose him to be the leader, because he needed someone like him with an A personality. Um, he, he was a guy who, to our knowledge, had, had done no public speaking. He was a fisherman. The only thing he was doing was yelling at fish. Um, he had no organized schooling or training that we know of, other than the fact that he was sitting at the seat of Christ. And um, on, on one day, um, on, on day one of Christ's departure, he's going to be the lead spokesman for the entire group. He does a splendid job. Not sure that any of the other disciples could have pulled this off, but he's the one that did. So the straightforward approach is something pastors, because of their position, can do uh, with impunity. Uh, it's kind of expected for us to be direct uh, in the hospital room where a person is dying uh, to ask them, uh, have you made your peace with God? Uh, what I asked a gentleman not to uh, a couple years ago, well, four years ago now. I don't do a whole lot of that type of visiting anymore, but, um, you know, and, and he had. And I didn't know him, so I was thankful to hear that. For others, it seems to require not only a type A personality, but you better know what you're talking about and have answers to any questions that may come at you. And then the next three approaches are much softer, and you probably already saw this or read it. The setup approach, um, you set people up to hear the good news, uh, like Matthew. Um, Jesus said, I'm coming to your house today. Matthew goes out and he gets other tax collectors, and he brings them in there so that uh, Jesus could talk to them. In my book, I talk about um, the businessman Arthur DeMoss and, uh, and what he would do. And I, I would share that, but I'm running out of time. So just you can read that in there, how he set it up, and he would bring in to his house up to 500 people to listen. Now, I don't know where I would put 500 people in my house, all right? But he has a huge house. I did a, a moving job once when I worked for them between pastorates, and, and there was a guy who lived in the outhouse, not, not an outhouse, but in one of the outbuildings, and, uh, which was a house. And we had to get some stuff in, that were in the basement of DeMoss's house, and it was like a Walmart. I mean, this place was just the basement. I never saw anything else, just the basement. Well, at any rate, he had scores of business people. That, that would come and listen to the gospel from Christian entertainers or speakers or sports figures, and he'd hand out a card, and uh, you know I think the results were often uh, between 30 or 40 of them either made a decision to follow Christ or wanted more information. That's a setup approach, and you could, you could do that um, and, and then invite the pastor over or one of the elders or, or Nell. Um, and you want to invite somebody over, and else the girls, you know, uh, because she'll get right into it. So, uh, okay, that's, that's it. And then the summoner or solicitor approach, I'm trying to stay with S's, and, and that was a problem. But um, this is like what the Samaritan woman did when she goes into town, come and see the, the man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? It's what Philip did with Nathaniel. You've got to come and see the Messiah. Um, 30 years ago, Elmer Towns and Larry Gilbertson created an organized packet of material to be used for a church to conduct a friend day, and the goal was to bring friends. And, um, and so the Nathaniel Project has the last Sunday, week number nine, uh, to be, bring friends. And I had the opportunity of preaching one of these uh, in Florida, and uh, 15 Nathaniels were there that day, two of them. Um, accepted Christ. And, and even if, if not, we're creating a culture of evangelism. So your friend day, your friend and family day, or family and friend day, whoever that goes, is February 27th, I believe. Um, every one of you needs to invite that Nathaniel to come with you. Every one of you, okay? 
this place should be packed with people here. And in, in the process of doing it, don't just call them up and say, hey, would you come to my church uh, and hear a really good sermon? All right, no, no. no. You, you call them up and say, I'd like to pick you up on this Sunday, and we're, would you go with me to church on this Sunday? And uh, afterwards, I'll take you to lunch. All right, see, you bribe people. No, you're not bribing people. It's just, it, it's just a great way to do it. You know, I, I, we'll go to lunch. I'll take you to lunch. You know, and, uh, and so that really works as well. So uh, that's the summoner uh, approach. And then the service approach, Tabitha and Dorcas, or, or Dorcas, not sure which name. I think she used both. Uh, from Acts chapter 9, she was full of good works and acts of charity. And uh, doing good deeds and acts of kindness should not only be the identifier of every Christian, but there are some who use this as an outreach. They're, they're known for their benevolent care for people and um, we, we do not do good deeds solely out of altruistic motives. We do it because we're commanded to love others. And behind that is our desire to demonstrate the love of Christ so, so that that person may come to a saving knowledge of Jesus. So these acts of kindness and service approach only work uh, in bringing people to Christ to explain the reason why you're doing it. And then finally is the story approach. And this is exemplified in the life of one of the blind men who they drug before the Pharisees because he was healed on the Sabbath. And he said, I, I don't know what happened to me. He said, I was blind, but now I see. He told a story. Uh, later he found Christ, or Christ found him, and, uh, and he indeed became a follower of Jesus. So telling your story is a way of presenting the gospel, especially um, you have to be careful if you've had an adult conversion. No, no, if you've had an adult conversion, that's great. Uh, if it's a child conversion, that can be a challenge. And, and I was five years old when I accepted the Lord at our church in southwest Philly, and uh, I sat in the front pew when I went forward, and, and my dad, who had been drafted by the New York Giants to play football, big man, and uh, C.E. Kirkwood, C.E. Kirkwood, I see my Snyder friends here, C.E. Kirkwood was sitting in the other side of me, and he was a big man too. And there was little old me, five years old, weighing in at 285 pounds. Um, and I remember Dad saying, Danny, do you understand? And I did. Childlike faith. That's all it was. But I can't tell that story, other than the funny part of my weight. I can't tell that story to an adult because what was the difference? What was the change? And so in my book, I share the EE um, testimony that I would use with most people and uh, how that I'm thankful that, that of the peace that God gives to me, especially when I've gone through challenges and grieving. My dad was killed when, when he was 50 and I was 24. Um, my son was killed when, when, when he was 30, um, you know, both in the same way. Um, so, but that peace that God gives that passes all understanding, and then from there, uh, I can share what Christ did. Well, back in the, uh, in the 1980s when I was young and raring to go, I was trained to be a leader in evangelism explosion, which I know Rick has been a part of, and there may have been anybody else a part of evangelism explosion? Now was? Okay, okay, great, great, great. Um, I was trained at the First Baptist Church in um, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, not D. James Kennedy Church, a different one. And part of the evangelism explosion that was so unique was not only the great outline that they had, and the two questions, like question one, have you come to the place in your spiritual life where you know for sure that if you were to die today, you'd go to heaven? That's a great question to start with. And, and then follow it up, because most people say, yeah, sure. And then say, well, uh, suppose you were to die today, and God were to ask you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? you'll get all sorts of answers, especially if they don't know Christ. And so those two questions are, are great. Their outline is terrific, and I saw Rick showing that this morning when I came in for Sunday school. But they also have what they call OJT, on-the-job training. And this is where you take what you learn in the classroom each week, and you go out with a trainer uh, who takes two very nervous individuals to someone's house to share the gospel. Well, since we were just there for a week or less, I don't know how long it really was, um, they were going to do OJT, and, and it was just, um, um, we were only going to do one. 
And uh, one would have thought that this big strapping preacher would have been assigned to the leader of the seminar or one of the pastors of the church, certainly an elder or a deacon, someone important. Well, that didn't happen. Uh, the person assigned to us was our polar opposite. Chuck and I were from the Northeast. He was a member of my church, both tall, handsome, perhaps a little overweight. Uh, okay, we were overweight. Um, but the trainer was from Florida, short and lean. Um, we were big, burly, bruising guys. She was petite, soft-spoken, a school teacher. I think she taught fourth grade. That's what I think she taught. I don't recall much of the first visit. I, I, she may have presented the gospel. Uh, apparently, they knew Christ. We ended up making a good visit for the church. I vividly remember the second one. It was a man in his mid to late 50s. He was living in an apartment by himself. And I watched this mild-mannered olive oil from Popeye cartoon turn into Wonder Woman, and she didn't need a phone booth in which to change. She presented the gospel to the man in such a clear way, and he responded by asking Jesus into his life. What a wonderful thing. Then we learned the rest of the story. And the rest of the story was that he had a loaded pistol on his nightstand and was planning to take his life that night. Now, if, if this was just a sales meeting uh, at the roundup, I would have thought that it was, um, you know, they put this thing up. But, but no. This woman, um, she was a small, diminutive lady, but she calmly handled everything in sharing Christ. And she did it her way. She, she loved Jesus, she loved her family, she loved her fourth graders, she loved sharing her faith, she was very effective, she did it her way, she was a true follower of Jesus Christ. That same Jesus that died on the cross for you, your sin and mine, died on the cross for, your, for the sins of your Nathaniel. That same Jesus died for them too, and the responsibility falls on you to share with them about the good news. Not on me, I don't know them. Not on your pastor, he doesn't know them. You know them. God placed them in your life and that's your responsibility. Um, and and uh, so figure out what approach you're going to use and then use it. Get your game face on and go with the plan. We were gonna close in a, in a song, a missionary song. Um, and um, believe it or not, it's not in your hymn book. So don't even open it up. I can't believe it's not in the hymn book. Uh, Pastor Joel and I can't believe it's not there. But when I woke up this morning, I always have a song in my head. Sometimes it's a very good song. Sometimes it's Chicago or somebody else that's not so good. But uh, this time it was a good one. And the refrain goes this way. I'll go where you want me to go, dear Lord. You know this. Or mountain or plain or sea. I'll say what you want me to say, dear Lord. There's the point that I, that, you know, that I was emphasizing. I'll say what you want me to say, dear Lord. I'll be what you want me to be. Is that your prayer? Could that be your prayer today? I think if that's your prayer and that's your attitude, then when you start to go to your Nathaniel, which you should have already started to do, but when you start to go to them, he will give you the words to say. Father, I thank you for my friends, and I'm just so thrilled that I could be here today and uh, that you gave me the healing that, that I need in order to be able to do this and, and, uh, and to be able to share with these uh, dear folks, um, our friends. And uh, Lord, uh, they're, they're coming towards the close of this Nathaniel project, and uh, some um, have already started working with their Nathaniel and they're ready to go and maybe they shared the gospel already with them and God bless them, thank you. Others are working through it, working up the energy to be able to do it and the, uh, and the emotional stamina and, uh, and be being able to be ready for this thing. I pray that you'll, you'll give them um, not only the ability uh, but the passion to do so and we're also praying for this special Sunday uh, that'll be at the end of this month, and we're praying that you'll help us uh, as we share Christ uh, that day, as the pastor does, or whoever's speaking. But Lord, we need to bring our Nathaniels, and so I pray that, uh, that we'll do that, and uh, that there will be a, a great harvest for souls. And then this doesn't end at the end of the program. Uh, the Nathaniel Project continues on, 
um, as we we continue to share our faith with those people that you place in our life. So we commit this to you. We thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.